it's been, you know, it's been said, I remember hearing this growing up, it's been said, the last thing to get saved is your wallet. I remember hearing that all the time. Where do, where do these things come from? Where do these thoughts that we have towards money, where do they come from? And uh, I, I had a lot of time to think about this. I've been uh, redoing my deck with my father-in-law. And, and, and so I've had a lot of time. Uh, which is dangerous, to sit and process this topic. And the question that I've been asking myself, and I want to ask you to consider this as well this morning, is the question of this. Why did God bless you with more than you need? Why did God bless you with more than you need? And, and I've been wrestling through that because he, here's the reality. When we talk about the wealthy in scripture, you guys, you just need to understand and know it's talking to us. We're the country that is, 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 is very, very wealthy. And, and, and as a byproduct of that, just us being able to live here, uh, we put, we're put in that upper echelon around the world of wealth. We are looked to as people uh, that are the wealthy ones, that are the rich ones. Uh, and, 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 and so uh, it's speaking directly to us. And, and it's this question that, that, that I've been working through. Why has God blessed me with more than I need? The apostle Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament, he was a mentor to a young guy named Timothy. Uh, as a young pastor, Timothy uh, was pastoring in uh, Ephesus at the time. Uh, and, and by this time, uh, as he's pastoring there, many wealthy people had embraced uh, Jesus. And churches were popping up in many of uh, the port cities around the Mediterranean. These port cities, they were epicenters of, of trade uh, and wealth. And Paul, who'd planted many of these churches, he knew uh, that wealthier people faced unique challenges as they adopted Christianity as their faith. And just like today, the Christians of Paul's time, they were vulnerable to the effects of money. So he addressed this topic in his letter uh, to uh, Timothy. And he says this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, uh, 17. Now listen, I sent our production guys so many verses, okay? So listen, don't be mad at them if the verse is wrong or it's just in the section, okay? Uh, write down what the verse is. I'm gonna read it and then you could go back and look at it, all right? Uh, so 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 says, he says this to the young pastor, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So Paul says, teach against the arrogance that comes from money and teach against the, the danger of making money their primary source of hope. Warn them. Now, listen, let's be really, really clear. The Bible doesn't say that wealth or having a lot of money or having a great job is a bad thing, okay? Wow, you guys are, you're like, hey, he's talking about money. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm gonna check the scores of the game. Oh no, there's no NFL games today. What do I do, <laughs> right? Yeah, uh, wake up, okay? Guys, the Bible doesn't say, I'll say it again, that wealth or having a lot of money is a bad thing. There's a lot of people in the Bible uh, that were very influential, that had uh, a lot of money, a lot of wealth. God blessed them with that. And so uh, when we're hearing this, uh, this isn't something that he's, uh, that, that, that listen, that we go, oh, well, money's just bad. That's not uh, what he's uh, saying. 
okay? I want to be really clear on that. I had someone come up to me after the first gathering and go, of course you teach on that right after I get back from my cruise. Oh. And I go, man, no, I'm glad you got to go on a cruise, all right? This isn't the martyr mentality uh, of like, well, I can't have anything like, or, or do anything. Like, no, that's not the message, okay? But what the Bible does do is it warns us Okay, it warns us about the dangers of money because money, like nothing else we see, has this incredible gravitational pull on our hearts. This is a conversation today about our hearts. Guys, Matthew chapter 6, 21, it says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 6, 9 and 10, once again, Paul writing this, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many uh, pangs. Okay, are you, are you hearing this? We need to speak to this. We need to talk to this because where your treasure is, your heart is going to follow. You need to hear because he's, he's saying the love of money is the root of all of these other things that will destroy your life. The, the, the love of money, you guys, it, it, it's, it's so much stronger than we acknowledge, than we even uh, know. And, and, and listen, here is also what's, uh, what's important for you to hear. This is not only a gravitational pull for people that are blessed with a lot of wealth. Okay? Uh, this pulls people regardless of how much money they have, okay? I mean, you may be sitting here listening to this and going, well, I'm a college student. I've got nothing but debt, okay? So uh, it doesn't matter. You could still be looking to money as the solution to your problems. You could be pursuing that a job, um, a, a figure and saying, if I just arrive there, everything else will be okay. And guys, that's not just for the super wealthy that we would look to. That is anybody and everybody, regardless if you say, I've got nothing uh, to hear. We're all in danger uh, of this pull that money can have on our lives. It can take your life goals, the goals that Christ has for you. It, it can hijack your, your decisions, uh, your family your priorities, and ultimately your relationship with God. And, and guys, I could have a panel of highly successful people come up here and share story after story after story where that has been true. It took my marriage. It took my relationship with my kids. Uh, it took my priorities. It took my goals. It hijacked my heart. And guys, there's a lot of you in this room that could speak to some of those things as well, huh? And Paul says, it will, it will draw you into this direction. He says, speak against it, this direction of arrogance and the illusion of self-sufficiency. You guys, when he talks about being arrogant, being arrogant is having an inflated sense of self-worth. Okay, that's what it is. It's when you look at yourself uh, like that. And, and, and so uh, in a sense, it's easy to see how we could fall into it, isn't it? It's easy to see how we could fall into it because why? Human nature uh, tells us that our identities are defined by our possessions. Okay, that's, that's what is, is reinforced, that's what we're taught, and that's what we experience as early as grade school. Okay, that's, that's the message that we start growing up with. Um, I remember for me, it was in elementary school. I've, I've probably shared this before, but I remember in elementary school, uh, there was a particular jacket 
and it was the jacket. It was called a starter jacket. And you had to have a starter jacket. Like, like if you didn't have one, you weren't in. And so I remember going home and, and, you know, I didn't come from like a lot of money. My dad was a pastor in the small community. Like we weren't rolling, but I, I just said, dad, I came home. I was like, you have to get me a starter jacket, please. You don't understand. Teach on tithing again. Like you don't understand. I have to have a starter jacket, dad. I'll never forget Christmas. And I open up. And there it is, a starter jacket. And all my problems as a kid were solved. <laughs> I showed up to school. I'm in. I walked different that day. And guys, that carries on. High school, same thing, first pair of Jordans. And I walked slow. And I remember when I laced them up, the first game I was going to play in those. And I remember going, you're a different player tonight. <laughs> you, were, you were Steve this morning, but now you're different. And I remember looking at the other team. Are you prepared for this? <laughs> you know, like it's on. Do you see what I'm rolling in tonight? And guys, do you see how at an early age, we're instilled with what I have affects how I see myself, my status, success. And, and it's all the way through the car that I get to then growing up and, 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 and the, the job, the, 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 the clothes, uh, the house, the area of town uh, that I, I live in. Guys, these are all things that communicate uh, status, self-worth, and it's what, man? It takes us to this place of arrogance. It drives us, it controls us to ultimately having an inflated self-view. Paul knows that. He says, warn them. It, it'll take you right on that journey. You won't even know it. And all of a sudden, that's how you're viewing yourself, defining uh, yourself, defining uh, whether God's blessed you or uh, not. But, but that's not the only thing that he's like, warn them against this. Paul's saying, it can hijack your hope. Oh. Guys, it's one thing to have hope and riches, but it's another thing to have your hope in your riches. When riches become the source of our hope, we are headed for trouble. Proverbs eleven twenty eight 28 says, whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green uh, leaf. Uh, ultimately, uh, the writer of Proverbs in Proverbs chapter 30, verses eight and nine, literally says, listen, God, I just ask, don't give me too much money and, 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 and don't make me poor. Just you give me whatever you know I need because I don't want to fall away from you. So just give me, you know me, just give me what I need to honor you. That's it. And guys, uh, you know, we are, we, we need to be responsible with money. We need to learn and grow in that. We launched a class called Financial Peace at the church to help people learn how to, to be responsible, to get out of uh, debt, to, to, to learn how to take care of your family, to plan well. Like, like there's certain things that are very important, your savings, uh, you, you know, life insurance. There's a lot of things uh, that, that, yes, we need to grow and learn how to be responsible but we have to be careful against placing our hope in our resources. Jesus knew all about the dangers of money and that's why he talked so much about it. So how do we guard our hearts against these effects that money can have on us? Well, what did, going back to 1 Timothy 6, what, what did Paul say there in, in, in verse 17? He said, once again, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes 
on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Do you see it? He says, listen, tell them to not place their hope in that, but to place their hope in God. Place their hope in God. That is the unshakable hope. That is the hope that withstands the crazy circumstances that happen in our lives. And he continues in verse 18, he says, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. This, this, this generosity, this lifestyle of generosity, to be rich in good works, to be generous, to be ready to share, to, to, to do good uh, and, and to give. Uh, it's interesting. One day, uh, Jesus was, was preaching to his followers. And as he's preaching to his followers, this argument uh, breaks out into the crowd. Okay, uh, and, and, and what happened was one of the people in the crowd uh, called out another and said, you're greedy. No, I'm not. And so Jesus, in response to this argument, he tells a story. And in Luke chapter 12, uh, verses 16 through 21, it says, and he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. Man, we love that verse, huh? Ooh, I want to underline that one. <laughs> but God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. See, like most things Jesus said, this parable represented a monumental shift from conventional thinking. Whenever we have more than we need, our natural assumption is that what? This is for me. But that's the wrong mindset. And in this practical way, Jesus was exposing the flaw in that way of thinking. If we just simply store up for ourselves and are not rich towards God, then everything we possess will be a total loss. Guys, this, man, this story, I mean, this is like, he is like nailing the American dream, right? Man, we just need that successful year this year. Man, if we just hit this number and all of a sudden this individual uh, in the story that he's talking about has a great year. I mean, such a great year that he's like, I don't know what to do with all this extra money. Man, this is incredible. And so he talks to his financial consultant probably and, and, and and, and, and it's like, oh yeah, totally. I, I have it. I have the margin. I have the ability to do this uh, because I am so blessed. And so I'm going to tear down that and build bigger, uh, uh, bigger storehouses so that I can store all of this wealth that I've been blessed with. And then I'm good for years. This is incredible. This sounds like the American dream. But, but, but Jesus, all of a sudden in one story, in one, in one sentence, turns that whole dream upside down, doesn't he? Right? Like, you fool, like, you're, this very night, your life is going to be required of you. And what happens with all of that? Man, nothing. You guys, at some point, we are going to leave everything down here behind. What an uplifting message. We're all going to die and you can't take anything with you. Guys, 
Matthew 6, 19 and 20, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. And then in 1 Timothy 6, 7, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything anything out of the world. Guys, when you were born, there was nothing there. You're naked. That's how you came in. And guess what? Just as a baby comes in, nothing, guess what? That's how we leave. Nothing. We're not taking any of this with us. Spent a lot of time on that deck, not taking the deck to heaven. Okay? Staying here. And, 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 so, and so he's speaking to how and what we're gonna invest in while we have this time knowing that at some point in time that we don't know, I mean, this guy's thinking, what? I've just landed, I'm done. And yet, just like that, it's gonna stand before God. And it's like, uh, you know, living in light of eternity and the fact that am I investing financially, am I investing my life into the things that are eternal, right? And that's the heart of it. And, and it's not just what Jesus is getting at as well. It's not just this, this, this one area, this one percentage. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's looking at our resources from a totally different perspective. And if we embrace Jesus's teaching and what Paul says here, we get this plan on how to avoid the pitfalls of money, but also how to be an incredible blessing with the resources that God has entrusted with us and to live a life of generosity. But you guys, it has to start with the right perspective. You know, about 3,000 years ago, David was the king of Israel. And for years, David had led his people uh, on a journey to make God's chosen people uh, a, a nation. And, and, you know, the history uh, of uh, the nation of Israel, I mean, they, they had lived in, in tents they, and they even carried this portable version uh, for God's house called the tabernacle, which contained the Ark of the Covenant, okay? The first set up and tear down church. Um, eventually, David reached a point in his life when he'd arrived, finally arrived, right? That's what we would say, he's arrived now where all his enemies had been defeated. Israel was the reigning superpower uh, of the time and there was peace. But David, as he's looking out, as, as man, he's got this incredible house and, and situation. Uh, he can't help but noticing that God still only had this temporary home because the tabernacle was a tent. And so David decided to build a a permanent home for God, a temple. And he began designing the architecture. He began uh, raising uh, the money for this incredible vision. David allocated gold and and silver from Israel's national treasury uh, to pay for construction. He even donated a large portion of his own money for the project. In fact, when you read how much uh, many uh, scholars actually put it as somewhere he donated in our terms around $14 billion of his own money. When David called the Israelites together in Jerusalem to announce the plan to build the temple, the people were excited. They were ecstatic and money just started pouring in for this vision. In the midst of this, David prayed a prayer that gives us insight into his heart and perspective towards God and the purpose of money. This is such a powerful section of scripture. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 10 through 14, this is what he says. It says, therefore, David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our father forever and ever. 
Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you and of your own have we given you. Man if someone's struggling with the perspective on money and what God's word says and the heart and the attitude and the posture, I go, man, read that, read that. Because what you hear is, God, this is all about you. This is all about you. And what else do we see? God, everything already belongs to you. It's already yours. The gold and the silver from the treasury, all the money from the people, all they were doing was just moving God's money from one place to the next. See, not only did God own all of the material things, but also he was the source of the things that, that money can't buy. And, and David talks about those things, the honor, the power, uh, the strength. Um, you, you look at everything a person enjoys in life. That's what he's essentially speaking to. Everything you can experience and enjoy, uh, as well as everything that enables you to accomplish those things, it, it goes back to God. It comes back to God's doing to the point where David even considers himself unworthy to be able to give to God. He literally goes, I, I, I'm unworthy. I can't even believe that, that myself and the people that we're able to, to give uh, back to you, that we would have this opportunity to be generous. I mean, guys, this is the opposite of many of us today because our mindset is what? This is mine. I worked for it. I'm entitled to do whatever I want with it. That's our mindset. Some of you have, you've worked really, really hard. Some of you, maybe it was just gifted to you, passed down to you. Either way, uh, it's so easy for me to what? Take ownership and go, look at this. And even in a giving context, go, God, look at what I'm gonna give to you. Look at how much I give to you. And guys, that is the opposite of what David's talking about. You guys, God gives us both. Uh, he gives us everything we have. And he doesn't just give you everything you have. Uh, the, the thing that you're proud of in your life, you guys, God has given you both the ability and the opportunity to do the work, whatever you've done. He gave you that ability, okay? Like if you can do anything physically, you better be praising God. And you better meet some people who weren't so blessed as you physically to understand how blessed you are, just to be able to do what you do physically, mentally, all these things, opportunities uh, that have fallen into place. Guys, we don't look back enough at the opportunities that have just happened. And you're like, wow, that's crazy how that happened. God. So any opportunity, any ability that you have to do anything, guys, that's not you. You weren't birthed and you're like, okay, God, this is the buffet of things I want in my life. Boom, 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 okay? No, nope, that's the wrong religion. That's another religion, okay? You, did, you didn't have say in that. That's all God's doing, okay? Uh, Deuteronomy 8, uh, 17 uh, and 18. Uh, <laughs> I love this. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. He's talking to the nation, his chosen people. We see in Psalms 50, uh, 10 verse through 12, for every 
Beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the fields is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you for the world and its fullness are mine. You get it? You hear the message here? So if everything belongs to God and comes from God, what should be the one thing that defines my approach to my wealth, my money? Him. How can I honor you with this God? See, there's this, uh, there's also this dangerous legalistic mindset that, that some of us have grown up in. Some of us have seen if we've got this church background and it says this to us, as long as I give God his cut, I'm free to do with the rest of it, whatever else I want. God, I covered that. Now I get to do whatever I want with the rest of this. Here's yours, God. See, David pointed out, what, who am I that I'm even allowed to be generously and give back? You guys, God owns it all anyway. So I'm just really, when I give, I'm giving back to him of what was already his. See, tithing and giving, that, that's not giving. Tithing is returning. See, we're not to honor God with just this a percentage. We're to honor him with all that we possess. And when you view your possessions that way, it changes everything. Man, we have this incredible privilege to steward God's money. Guys, ask him what he wants you to do with it. That should be a regular thing. God, what do you want me to do with your resources? Remember, why did he give me more than I need? God, what do you want me to do? Guys, if you sit down with a financial planner, many of you have, and we have some financial planners that go to this church, but if you sit down with a financial planner, one of the first questions they ask you is what? What are your goals? What are your goals? Now, why? Why do they ask that? Because they're handling your money. Okay, the planner's goals are uh, like their personal goals. Those are irrelevant because you aren't discussing their money. I've never met with a financial planner and been like, hey, so what do you do? I don't care what he does. I'm not talking about his money. Okay, a good money manager will handle your money with what? With your goals in mind, not theirs. Okay, if your financial planner just received a, uh, a check from you and, 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 and there were no instructions attached uh, from the check, you know what they would do? They wouldn't go shopping with that, would they? They'd call and they'd ask you, what do you want me to do with these assets? Okay, guys, that's what our response should be with God, amen? God, what do you want me to do? This is yours, When we look at um, what we see uh, throughout scripture, and man, I know, I know this is so tough and I've been talking for a while, ah, but we're gonna keep going. You guys, when we look at this, and I'll, I'll try and go through this as quick as I can. The principle, when we just look at, because we hear these terms and it's important that we understand where they came from. The principle of tithing, it was ingrained in the beliefs and lifestyles of the early Christians, most of whom grew up in Jewish homes. And the first fruits, we also, we see this term, the first fruits. The first fruits, uh, it referred to the first products of the seasonal harvest. So symbolically, the giving of the first fruits, um, it acknowledged God's ownership of the land and of all the crops that would follow. Okay, so this was the first products of that harvest. The people, before the people consumed the rest of the harvest, they were to give God the best part of the first part of the harvest. If that wasn't done, there would be no blessing on the rest of the crop. And so we see this uh, throughout scripture, this mindset of giving to him the best and giving to him uh, first. And it's a great principle, isn't it? It's, it's a great principle to have, especially in light of God giving us his first best in Jesus. But the first teaching that we see about tithing as a law, it occurs in Leviticus 27, uh, 30. And, and what we see is the meaning of the word tithe is literally a 10th, okay? It's a 10th part. 
But we see uh, throughout the Old Testament, the tithe belongs to the Lord and the tithe applied to everything. It was to be considered holy and set apart and given to God. The very first reference that we see where tithing occurs, uh, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's Abraham um, in, in Genesis 14, 20, coming back and tithing from the spoils uh, of war. And when he does this, it's literally 400 years before tithing uh, would become a law. And so God warned the Israelites that to present anything less than the full 10 was to rob him in Malachi 3, 8, 9. The Lord had expectations beyond the tithe. There were uh, free will. There were uh, voluntary offerings uh, when God would lay something on their heart and they would give sporadically to uh, that. But in his law, God taught his people to set aside a 10th of their crops as a teaching tool. By giving away the 10, they were making a statement about the remaining 90% that it all belonged to their creator. In the Old Testament times, they actually uh, gave three different tithes, but one was given every three years. So it amounted to roughly 23% of their overall uh, income. When we look at the New Testament, we see believers uh, who have the Holy Spirit indwelling them rather than falling short of, of tithing. The early Christians went far above and beyond it. Jesus affirmed it in Matthew 23. And the question I ask, because it, you don't see specifically you're to tithe in the New Testament, right? Um, but if something was right under the law, is it now wrong under grace? Jesus, as the fulfillment of the law, remember Jesus was the fulfillment of the law. He took everything a step further, didn't he? Grace always went further than the law. And we're thankful for that. Giving, when, when we see this, this posture and, and what happened in the New Testament, giving was, uh, was to be sacrificial. It was proportional. Okay, like uh, Jesus in, in Mark chapter 12, uh, he sits down with his disciples and he sits next to a giving box where people were coming and, and, and tithing and giving money. And there were people from all different um, statuses giving. There were rich people, wealthy people, uh, medium of the road people and, and poor people. And this, uh, this poor widow comes, she walks up and she drops two coins in there and Jesus is watching close enough and uses her as an example. He says, listen, uh, uh, she, she gave more than all of them because she gave out of what she didn't have and they gave out of all that they had. And so what we see is this heart, this posture that it's not about a dollar amount. It's about the sacrifice. It's, it's, it's about the, the, the proportion, the, the percentage of it. And, and so he's highlighting that. David said, I will not give the Lord that which costs me nothing. In the New Testament, it wasn't a matter of what you had. It was this proportional, and we see it was consistent, it was generous, and it was always dictated by God. Regardless of not seeing the word tithing instructed, you see offerings happening, Paul raising support and instructing Jesus' followers in churches to give every week in 1 Corinthians uh, 16. And we see in 1 Timothy 5, pay uh, your pastors. And Jesus had donors. Jesus had donors. They were following, that were giving. A ton of them were these wealthy women that were giving to his ministry. And guys, we see blessings attached to the giving. There's blessings that are, that are promised, not because we give in order to get which is very dangerous and is a very dangerous theology and it's very detrimental to everything he's trying to accomplish here. But there are promises of blessings as a result of giving. Uh, we see uh, in, in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8, says the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. 
And so there's these blessings. Uh, Jesus highlights blessings as a byproduct of our of this kind of posture with our resources, with our money. Um, and Malachi three ten he challenges his people in the Old Testament. Test me in this. Test me. See how I respond. Guys, by giving, we're the ones that are blessed. And if you've never given to him, and I get asked this all the time, I've never given, I've never, uh, I've never made that a habit in my life. I feel like God's called me to do this. I've had life change and, and all of that. I, I encourage people, I say, well, I would start with, with 10, the, the 10%. We see that tithe, we saw it before the law. We see it uh, as a great model. And, uh, you know, if, if, if we're taking someone through premarital or whatever, and I've seen it in my own life, that's a great place to start. Uh, it's a great pattern to develop in your life. And then what, but I mean, the key is to just start. And then you allow God to do what God does. With your generosity, you allow him to then take that number and do what only he can do. And we have to remember that we just need to build into our lives the question of, God, how do you want me to honor you with what's yours? And God, it's not just a percentage, it's all of it. Because God, I understand and know that when you're talking about money here, you're talking about my heart. You're talking about my heart. That's why he talks about this so much because your heart is going to follow this. This isn't a conversation about money per se. It's a conversation about our hearts because it reflects our hearts. You guys, this isn't about ecclesia. Yeah, the church is blessed by your generosity and, and response and obedience but if you were talking to me and you went to some other church or maybe you're here visiting, you go to another church, I would tell you the same thing. You know why? Because this isn't about the church per se. This is about you and your relationship with God. Okay, I, I don't give because I'm a pastor here. I give because my Relation, because of my relationship with God, because of what I read in scripture. And, and, and guys, he, he, here's the reality, because I think this is tough for us, uh, especially those of us who have seen funds mismanaged. We've seen abuses in the church. We've seen, uh, we've seen pastors arrested. Uh, we've seen all of these things happen. We've heard the health and wealth, all of that. We've been manip manipulated. Uh, all these things that, that, that we've seen and experienced. And so we're like, I'm not given. I'm not given to that. I know what happens. I know what they must do. I know, I know what they must think. You guys, I want you to think about this for a second. Jesus had people giving to his ministry while he knew Judas was actively stealing from his ministry. Why didn't Jesus tell him, don't give to me? He's stealing it. because he knew it had nothing to do with Judas. It had everything to do with them and God. And so if you've been hurt or wounded, guys, I'm sorry. I am. I grew up. I, I've seen it. I felt it. I've been burnt by this. But I'm telling you, you have to guard against that because it's not about a person, a religious figure, a particular church or organization. It's just about me and God, and that's it. Respond to that. And when we do that and look at our lives in that way, it has not just an impact on the here and the now, it's an impact for eternity, amen? That's the goal to leave an eternal impact. We don't know when our last breath's gonna be, but I pray to God he uses me to the end to have an eternal impact for his work. That's how we view our wealth, our lives. It's through this eternal lens. And when you do that, you guys, you loosen your grip on wealth and wealth loses its grip on you. I know. I didn't do it all justice, but you guys, I pray that we're able to once again come back to God and go, God, what do you want me to do with your money? And I pray that we ask, God, why have you blessed me 
with more than I need. He is so good. Amen. Let's pray.